What a delight to be able to continue to study this book of Jonah and how relevant it is today that as we have believers and unbelievers in the world, that God has called us to be the hands and feet and light to those that are around us. And Jonah is going to show us so much about God's grace and mercy. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for today. I thank you for the book of Jonah. I pray, Lord, even though it was written thousands of years ago, that it is still relevant for us today. Let your spirit move in our hearts and minds as we see your word come alive and recognize within ourselves the Jonah's in us. And I pray, Lord, that you will guide and direct this time in Jesus' name. Amen. So, Jonah, this is lecture one, and we're going to be doing the verses 1 through 13. It says, The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. Now, we learned that Jonah actually meant dove. And Amittai means truth. So Jonah knew the truth. He was a prophet. He would speak the truth of God. And it's interesting to note that a dove, which is a bird, birds can recognize a storm. And I think Jonah recognized a storm. That's why he started to flee. It says, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come to up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, and paid the fare, and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So here it is. He was supposed to go to Nineveh, which is 550 miles away, which is a long trip. But then he turned, and he decided to go to Tarshish, which is 2,500 miles away. So Jonah was trying to get as far away from Nineveh and as far away from what God wanted him to do. This was extreme. But when God speaks, we need to be obedient and we need to make sure that we tune our lives so that we can hear the voice of God. And when we hear the verse of God, we sometimes hear encouragement. But sometimes God tells us things that we are to do, how we are to adjust our lives and turn and go a different way. And I believe because God has a plan and a purpose for all of our lives that he has spoken to each one of us. And you know, there is a word for delayed obedience. The word for delayed obedience is disobedience. Anytime we delay obedience, we're walking in disobedience. And this is what Jonah was doing. Jonah saw what God wanted him to do, and he didn't want to do it. It's like the analogy of a football team that plays together, and they need to make that extra two points, and the coach makes a call from the sideline, and the player recognizes the call requires that he gets tackled, and all of a sudden he does not want to do it because he doesn't want to get tackled. But all he's thinking about is, his, is himself. He's not teaching thinking about the overall team and the overall win that they can have and that the coach can seize where the pocket was and knew he needed to bring distraction from the pocket that would be open for them to get the two points. Well, that is like God. God saw the bigger picture, but Jonah didn't like his play that he had to play in this, which was to go to Nineveh. But you can't imagine, Jonah had to know that Abraham did not want to take his son Isaac, to be sacrificed. There's many people in the Old Testament that they were obedient even though it didn't wasn't what they wanted. I mean, there was Moses that was told to go to Egypt to rescue his people, and Moses was making every sort of excuse. And I'm sure little old David, when he looked out there, he did not want to go out and face that giant. Sometimes when God calls us to do something, it's not easy. But obedience is something that God asks us to do. Because obedience brings intimacy. And it's easier for us to be intimate with the Lord and be obedient when we have that deeper intimacy. I love that word intimacy. It's into me see, meaning God sees into me and knows me, and I see into God and I know God. You know, a lot of seasoned people in the Lord, when I get to speak with them, which I am always delighted to do, I asked them how it's so much easier for them to obey. And they says, because they know God and they've seen him be faithful, even when it didn't make sense. So God wants intimacy with each one of us. And that can be through prayer and the word and that God will continue to reveal himself to us. 
Now, in this book of Jonah, we will see that God is all over Jonah. I mean, he does not leave him. He wants that intimacy and that relationship. But sometimes there's the distractions, and sometimes those distractions come from self. Sometimes it comes from outside. That's why it's so important for us to be in relationships with people, people that will point us and help us to the things of God. You know, it's like if you wanted to have a diet and you knew you needed to eat all healthy food, then all of a sudden you go to a function and the only thing there is like cheesecakes and brownies and you're tempted. But if you have people that are around you that know that you're on this diet, they're going to encourage you. Let's just walk right by this and go to the veggie tray. That's how we are to be with one another, to be in relationship with one another, to encourage us to walk in the things of God. We need that accountability in our lives. Now, Jonah wasn't going to go to Nineveh to tell people about God. He was going to go on this ship. Well, God has his plan now. God uses everything in our lives. So he wouldn't go to Nineveh to tell the pagans about God. So he gave him a ship full of pagans that he can now tell about God. He always wants to have intimacy, and he wants people to know about the Lord. So Jonah, he decides he's going to flee because he thinks he can flee from God's presence. But can any of us flee from God's presence? Absolutely not. So he takes off and running, but God doesn't let him go. It's like a mom that takes her kid to Walmart. And you know, you've either seen it or you've been one of the moms where you're in there and you're all of a sudden your child sees something they want and they're like, I want this, I want this, I want this. And you turn and tell them, no, that not today or you don't need it. And all of a sudden they go, ah, and they start throwing a fit and throwing themselves on the floor. You don't leave them at Walmart. You take them home. And that's the same with God now. Jonah was throwing a fit. He didn't want to do what God wanted to do, and he was running off in a tantrum. But God is going to take him back. He's going to run after him and bring him back. So Jonah runs, but God won't let him go. And what's interesting, it says that, and the Lord, the Lord in verse 4, hurled a great wind on the sea. That great is the same word that used in the great city of Nineveh. So if Jonah won't go to the great city of Nineveh, God's going to bring a great storm to Jonah. And that is what we learned today, that there are some things that might be dismaying in this first chapter, but there is some really great news. Because the dismaying thing is that when we act in disobedience to God, usually there's a storm that's attached to it. That seems to be the theme a lot in the Old Testament. Now, we have to be really careful because not every difficult thing that comes into our life is punishment for a particular sin or disobedience. I mean, the whole book of Job contradicts that whole common belief that good people will have lives that will go well because that is not true. Things can go wrong and bad in your life, but it is not a result of sin or your fault. You know, that is how God works and moves is that there is a bigger picture that sometimes we do not see. But we know this, that if we violate the laws of God, we're violating what he has designed us to be and to do, which is to love and serve him. And all storms are not because of sin, but sometimes they are. God disciplines those he loves. So here's the result of Jonah's disobedience, and it's immediately, and it's dramatic. Now, that's not always the case. There's a mighty storm that all of a sudden comes. And in this fury of thing, these pagan sailors can discern that this is a supernatural storm. This is not a normal storm. This is supernatural, and it must be because of a response to a dis disobedience. Now, this doesn't always happen. You don't all of a sudden always have a big storm as soon as sin hits. I mean, like sometimes you get um, exposed to radiation and you don't receive the consequences until much further down the road. But there is a consequence. So here's this mighty storm. It's attached to the disobedience of Jonah. And in Numbers 32, 23, it says, You will be sinning against the Lord and you may be sure that your sin will find you out. And Jonah's sin is going to find him out. So this was dismaying news, and Jonah, the storm was the consequence of his sin. Yet, you realize these sailors are now caught in it too. 
And most often the storms of life come upon us, not because necessarily our own sin, but it could be unavoidable consequences of living in a fallen, troubled world. And sometimes it's because of someone else that we're close to. So the sailors in this storm, they're going to come to have a genuine faith in the true God. That is the good news about this chapter. But Jonah himself begins a journey on this boat, not understanding God's grace and mercy. And this is what God wants him to see. So when storms come into our lives, whether they're consequences of our wrongdoing or not, we have the promise that God will be with us because God was with Jonah. So in verse 4, it said that um, the Lord hurled a great wind on the sea and this great storm and the ship was about to break up. And then in verse 5, it says, Then the sailors became afraid. Now, these sailors are sailors that have been on the sea, and they have been in storms before, but they become afraid. And every man cried out to his God. So they start crying out to every God they can think of, because pagans believed everything was a God. And they hurled the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below into the stern of the ship and had laid down and fallen asleep. They thought the boat was going to fall apart. God responded with this fierce storm. William Banks says this, Rebellion never escapes God's notice, and it's foolishness for men to think that they can resist God's will. The Lord may let a man go to a certain point before he steps in, but when he does not move, he moves with no uncertainty. So here's this great wind, and they begin praying to their gods. They keep praying to their gods, and still the storm continues on. And they're hurling all this cargo out into the sea. They're doing all these things, trying to appease. But no sacrifice other than obedience will do. They do not realize this at this point. Jonah knows the power of God and that nothing can stop him. And that he can create the seas, but he can calm the seas. But where is Jonah? Jonah is asleep below deck. He had rejected God's purpose and had just gone down and gone to sleep. So in verse 6, it says, So the captain approached him and said, How is it that you're sleeping? Get up! Call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. So he says, Come on, wake up. Get up here. He didn't realize, Jonah didn't realize that he was truly a missionary on this ship, that he was a representation and an opportunity to share God. He had this great opportunity, but Jonah had just gone down and gone to sleep. He had decided to reject going to Nineveh and preach there. And so he decided he wasn't going to talk to these pagans that were on this ship either. And he just decided he would sleep. Some say he was in the sleep of sorrow. And we can all relate to that because sometimes when things are so bad in our life, all we want to do is curl up in a ball and just go to sleep to make it all kind of go away. I'm sure he was exhausted and drained and had powerful emotions. But here's the contrast between the sailors and Jonah. Jonah was out of touch with the peril that was going on. And the sailors were extremely alert to that. Jonah was thoroughly absorbed in his own problems. The sailors were seeking the common good of everyone in the boat. They were trying to get rid of cargo. They were praying to their own gods. You know, they were doing everything they could. They were working for the common good of the whole boat. Jonah had no concern for the common good. These pagan sailors. It's not like this is in contrast like with the Samaritan. Those that should have helped the one, the beggar that was beaten up on the side, The Samaritan was the one that helped. You know, in the book of James, in James 2, 15 through 17, he says, If you say you have a relationship with God based on his grace, and you see someone without clothes and daily food and do nothing about it, you only prove that your faith is dead, that it's not real. That's what I love here at Estero. We have a group called FaithWorks, and through them we can be the hands and feet of providing food and need to those that need it. In verse 13 of James says, judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. The lack of mercy in Jonah's attitude and actions towards these others reveal that he really was a stranger in his heart to what God's mercy and grace was. 
So they called on their idols in verse 6, these false gods, and they prayed. They were throwing their throwing the cargo over. And, you know, they were doing everything they could to try to make the storm cease. But what I love about this, sometimes we will exhaust our own selves to try to get or fix our circumstances. And God does not want that. God is more concerned about obedience than our own way of doing things. So in the next couple verses, we're going to find out that so there's revelation, there's repentance and rescue. We're going to see revelation, repentance, and rescue. Revelation in John 1, 7 through 10. And each man said to his mate, come, let's cast lots so that we can find out whose account this catastrophe has struck. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us now on whose account has this catastrophic struck us? What is your occupation? Where do you come from? What is your country and what people are you? So he said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. I want us to recognize how of a shallow response that was because he identified himself first as a nation, as a race, and then he identified himself with God. Then the men became extremely afraid and they said to him, how could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So here they were calling on their first gods. They were throwing everything overboard. They asked him his occupation. He tells them the occupation. And they needed to hear about God. They didn't know the one true God. And when the lot fell on him, this was God's way of Jonah, waking Jonah up. This revelation is that the God, Yahweh, was the cause of this storm. The revelation was that there was a God that they did not serve. And his name was Yahweh. It was Jonah's God. So then in verse 11, it says, So they said to him, What should we do so that the sea will become calm for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. The sailors needed a solution, a big solution, because they were all in the same boat together, just like we are in the world together today, believers and unbelievers. They know the problem. Their idols, their idols, their small G's, their gods didn't work. The storm was just getting worse and worse by minute by minute. But Jonah's God could do something about that. So Jonah gives them the solution in verse 12. And he said to them, pick me up and hurl me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. Because I know that on account of me, this great storm has come upon you. So he's finally recognizing now that it's affecting others, not just himself. And he tells them to toss him overboard, that he is the guilty one. And that in this moment, though, he's not repenting. He's not saying, okay, Lord, I confess I should go to Nineveh. Let me turn around and go back to Joppa and let me go to Nineveh. He doesn't say that. He says to toss him over, but he's one, but he's saying, forgive me. And he wants to spare these men now by putting them overboard. But there was no change of heart for Jonah. Jonah, according to Brunaker, says, doesn't seem to be capable of simple repentance. He could have sought for forgiveness during the storm and committed himself to go to Nineveh. But perhaps he believes that's too much that water is passed under his ship by this time. Perhaps he's not sure that his repentance would be forgiven. And we know that's not true. He prefers to believe in a God who only judges and does not forgive. Do we do that at times? Because he'd rather die in the sea than suggest to the sailors that they turn around and return him to Joppa to complete Yahweh's call to Nineveh. But what do the... What do the sailors do after hailing this? This is what they do in verse 13. However, the men rowed desperately to return to land. They decided, no, they're going to try hard. They want to save all of them. They're still concerned for Jonah, but they could not because the sea was becoming even stronger and stormier against them. So they were desperately trying to get to land, which was futile. Because in their minds, there had to be another solution to Jonah being thrown overboard. Even though Jonah clearly proclaimed to them that 
Yahweh is the one that created the seas. He is the true God. They wanted an other solution other than the solution that God had given Jonah. But they are going to have a revelation about God. And we are going to talk about that next week as we continue on in Jonah 1, 14 through 17. Let's pray. Father, we thank you that in your word we see your mercy and how you run hard and fast after Jonah and how even when we are in disobedience, you are not far from us. You are still pursuing us. So I pray this week as we complete chapter one that we see how you reveal yourself how repentance comes, and how there is a rescue, and that you are the God that does all these. And so I thank you for each one of our lives and for how you're going to move and work in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. <music>